Hi, hello, my name is Gomer Joseph. I hope you've all been having a great day so far. Welcome back to another True Come Tuesdays video. If you are new, I welcome you. Before I discuss today's case, I'd like to mention my Christian Suspense book series, which is Never As It Seems. The first book in the series is available on Amazon, and you can read it on any device on the Kindle app for free. Not only that, but I do have another book series, which is the Juliet Clark book series. This book series is about a Haitian American teen sleuth who happens to be a successful true crime YouTuber. The first book in the series is titled Murderer at Heart, so the links will be in the description box below if you are interested. Today I'll be discussing the solved 1964 Mississippi Massacre. So first things first, it is Black History Month, a month where we observe the, ac the accomplishment that Black Americans have made in this country despite the obstacles that they faced. And sadly, this country has also dealt with dark, horrific events in regard to Black American history that we must never forget. Now, the 1964 Mississippi Massacre is one of those many events. Researching this case was very disheartening. These were such senseless murders, and it's sad that not everyone involved was held accountable for taking the lives of these three men. Now, I encourage you all to do your own research with this case and not to just look at my video for all of the information. Here we go. To make a long story short, I'm just going to go ahead and give some background with this case. So the 60s, especially the early 60s, was filled with definite racial tension, especially in the South, especially in a Southern state like Mississippi. Now the Civil Rights Act was about to be signed and in the state of Mississippi, there was a campaign to encourage Black Americans to vote. Sadly, the racist white people in the area didn't really like the idea of Black Americans having the same rights that they did. White civil rights activists from the North traveled down to Mississippi to help with this effort of getting Black Americans to vote. Before I, I go deeper into this, I'll explain what I know about the victims who honestly sacrificed their lives to get this work done. So I'll start with somebody who was actually a native of Mississippi. His name was James Cheney, who was born on May 30th, 1943 in Meridian, Mississippi, to parents Fannie Lee and Ben Cheney Jr. I do know that James had one brother and three sisters. So pretty much like, I guess his civil, work, his civil rights work began when he was 15. Um, I know that he wore a NAACP paper badge in support of that organization, but got in trouble in his segregated school out of fear of how the white school board would react. But that's just something I really don't get about the whole segregation thing back in the day. Like how do you have a, you know, segregated schools, but a white school board rules over you. That's pretty weird, but okay. Um, so James, as he grew older, he would take part in freedom rides and other peaceful civil rights demonstrations. Michael Schwerner was born on November 6, 1939 in New York City, New York, to Jewish parents, Ann Siegel and Nathan Schwerner. Now, Michael, he was known as Mickey to his friends, and he was somebody who was known to stand up for others, and as he grew older, I believe after graduating from college, he married a woman named Rita, who would join him in his civil rights activism. Andrew Goodman was born on November 23rd, 1943. He was also born in New York City, New York, and was also born to um, Jewish parents named Robert and Carolyn Goodman. I do know that Andrew did have two brothers. Now, his family was actually involved with civil rights work when he was growing up, which encouraged him to want, in, want, to, want to get involved in civil rights work as well. Now, on June 16, 1964, the KKK, and we all, at least, we all should know who the KKK are, you know, the white-hooded racist monsters who, you know, 
depicted absolute wickedness, especially back in the day, they attacked members of the Mount Zion Methodist Church who were holding a meeting for voting rallies. So after the members were beaten, the KKK burned the church down. On June 21st, 1964, five days after the attacks and the church burning, James, Michael, and Andrew were on the road as they planned to talk with the church members about what occurred the night of the burning. Now, Michael told his staff that they needed to call in some office that he was associated with if he didn't call his staff at 4 p.m. Since Michael never made the call, the FBI was called who contacted the local authorities, which seemed to be a huge mistake on the FBI's part because the local authorities decided to arrest the three men. So Michael was able to pay the bond that was made. So all three men were released that night. And if you want to know why they arrested, supposedly um, James, since he was born in the area, since he knew the area, he was the one in the car and he quote unquote was speeding, which is why the local police felt the need to arrest the three men. So after they were on the road, all three men were never seen alive again. Since the men went missing, the people of Mississippi assumed that the three men just ran off and that their disappearances was not that serious. But this is Mississippi. Civil rights era, Mississippi. On June 23rd, 1964, the vehicle that they were last seen in was discovered in a swamp area by two Native Americans, but the men were not found inside. So these two Native Americans contacted the FBI and the FBI then looked around the area, finding Michael's watch and the car keys. After discovering these two clues, there was a huge search party for all three men. In their search, they found a black man, a body of a black man, but it wasn't James. In fact, it was a man who was a victim of a KKK lynching. Since the KKK lynched black individuals a lot back then, since they would never face the consequences for it. So this search for the three men only fueled fire to the KKK's anger. And because of that anger and wicked hatred, they would go on to burn black homes, churches, and schools. Because of this craziness, the FBI was keeping an eye on individual KKK members. And since, since there was a lot of pressure from the FBI, informants began to be of use, explaining the type of mess that the KKK was involved with giving investigators some type of information of exactly who might have been responsible for the three men's disappearance. On July 31st, 1964, a secret informant who went by Mr. X told the investigators where the bodies were potentially buried. Now, this area was called the Old Jolly Farm, an area where the richest person in the district lived. So, lo and behold, after checking this area, the remains of all three men were discovered. Now, autopsies revealed that they were shot to death, but one tragic theory was that Andrew was probably still alive when he was buried, and this is such an awful experience, like, I honestly cannot even begin to imagine. A man named Wallace Miller, a local officer, and KKK member had enough of the violence that the KKK was partaking, partaking in, and he wanted to leave, but the FBI told him to stay as their mole. So since they had someone on the inside, the FBI received plenty of information about the murderers. So pretty much um, Deputy Cecile Price, the officer who arrested the three men, and seven other KKK members were convicted. But before the conviction, there was one trial, but after the trial, there was a hung jury. So there had to be another trial to get a conviction. Now, praise God, a good judge was placed over this case because 
I don't think that a judge who had hatred in his heart for people who had a different skin color than him would have allowed there to have been a second trial after a hung jury. So like I already mentioned before, seven other people were convicted of the murders, but it's alleged that 10 other men were responsible for killing the men, but they were not convicted. I have just got to say that after doing the research for this case, it just goes to show that having, obviously, you know, having hatred for someone is obviously very wicked and having hatred can just make you do absolutely ter terrifying, horrific things. The Bible is very clear that when you have hate for someone in your heart, then you're just as bad as a murderer. It's such a shame that these three men lost their lives when their whole lives were ahead of them. It's crazy to think that I outlived all of these guys. And I really hope that their deaths are not in vain. Like so many people in the past literally risked and lost their lives so that Black Americans like me can have the basic American rights that we have now. And even though not everyone was convicted, I find peace in knowing that the God that I serve, the God of the Bible, is a God of justice. And I believe that justice will come or has already come in his perfect time. I thank you all for taking the time in your day to watch this video. If you did like this video, please feel free to hit the like button. If you'd like to go ahead and share your thoughts on this case, please leave your thoughts in the comments section. If you'd like to see more videos from me, please feel free to hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified about the next video. If there's a certain true crime case that you'd like me to cover, go ahead and let me know. I will see y'all for the next true crime Tuesdays, and I will talk to y'all later.